Welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report. I'm host Dennis Skupinski. Base Hospital 36 played an important role during the First World War. It was the first thousand bed hospital to go to France and it contained some of Detroit's best medical professionals. It gave them a chance to demonstrate their craft to the world. There is more progress for the World War I Memorial and Museum here in Kansas City. President Obama signed a bill placing a landmark squarely at the center of the 100th anniversary of the Great War. KBC stands Michael Mahoney is live with what this all means, Michael. It means that a Blue Ribbon Centennial Commission marking the 100th anniversary of World War I, which started in 1914, will be based in headquarters out of the museum and the Liberty Memorial here, which is a landmark that dominates the Kansas City skyline. This is the nation's only monument and museum dedicated solely to World War I. It does not mean that it's been designated now as the nation's official World War I monument. It does mean that the Centennial Commission will be based out of Kansas City, so it does enhance its position. We have the best collection in the United States. We have great scholars. We have so much happening here. It is the proper place to have the commission uh, based and it's a proper place to have the centennial celebration take place. Now the debate over whether or not World War I should have its own monument on the National Mall in Washington, like World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, continues. We are leaving the D.C. Um, issue to those who live in D.C. An advocate for that Washington World War I monument, David DeYoung, says the Washington effort continues. Now the commission to be based here will have 12 members, three appointed by the president, others picked by Congress and veterans group. The commission will have to raise its own money for events, but the Liberty Memorial and Museum have a role. We are also guaranteed a place at that table because we, as the museum, are one of the 12 who will be there talking about what we as a nation should be doing. Now, Kansas City Congressman Emanuel Cleaver and the entire Missouri delegation pushed for this bill in a statement this afternoon. Cleaver said soon the eyes of the nation and indeed the world will be on Kansas City as we prepare for the centennial commemoration of World War I. And an added note, in the partisan nature of Congress right now, anytime a Democrat like Emanuel Cleaver can get a bill through the Republican House, or vice versa for that matter, it is indeed a small feat. That's the latest from here. Back to you. Indeed. Thank you, Michael. The 12 members of the World War I Centennial Commission may be named as early as later this spring. During part two of Base Hospital 36, we'll take a look at how Base Hospital 36 was organized and some of the medical professionals that staffed it. The headquarters section consisted of the commanding officer, professional director, adjutant, quartermaster, sick and wounded officer, and the chief nurse with the proper enlisted personnel. Each section had its specific duties. When a train of sick and wounded would arrive at the railroad station, it was met by a corps of ambulance with a driver and two orderlies, and the officer in charge of sick and wounded records. As a man left the train, he was tagged with his name, serial number for sick and wounded, and a hospital designation. The scheme worked entirely satisfactory, and of the 15,000 patients admitted, no man has lost his records. Hospital A, known as the Central, was called by Lieutenant Colonel Shirley, the Knights Templar Hospital, to commemorate the generosity of the Detroit Commandery. Hospital A opened as a hospital by receiving over 400 cases of the mumps on December 8, 1917. It received the first patient and was the last hospital to discharge a patient when our sick and wounded office was closed and our last convoy was evacuated to the Buffalo Unit, Base Hospital 23, on January 13, 1919. The plan of Hospital A was that it should be a special hospital for all afflictions and injuries of the head. The departments of eye, ear, nose, and throat and the dental department were located in the left wing of the main floor. The pharmacy was also placed in this wing to be within easy reach of the patients from these offices. During its time of operation, Hospital A served approximately 31% of all patients who went through Base Hospital 36 during the war. When a new convoy of wounded came in, 
The soldiers arriving were pale and tired. Most had not seen a bed for months. To get in between clean white sheets was to them, in their expression, living a life of Jerry. For one or two days it was a blissful sleep, except to be awakened at meal time and for dressing of wounds. In three or four days beds would become vacant, and by the end of the week few patients were still confined to the bed. Those recovering helped those less fortunate, and many made inquiries of the nurses and of the ward surgeons if there was something they might do to be of service. Many became volunteer nurses for their fellow soldiers and assisted in getting ready for the next convoy that was to come in in the next night or early the next morning. Here's an example of Hospital A. One of his patients, Private Thomas McKenzie from Detroit, came in with a gunshot wound to the face. After several plastic surgeries, he finally looked normal in 1922. He was worked on in Detroit at General Hospital 36, which is now Henry Ford Hospital. Hospital B, commanded by Major Frank B. Walker, was located in the Hotel Cirrus, having been built for a summer resort business, was partitioned into 187 rooms. There were six floors above the basement, respectively called Ward A, B, C, D, E, and F. In each ward, separate rooms were set apart as the ward surgeon's office and dressing room, a diet kitchen, a nurse's room, a lounging room for patients, ambulatory cases were examined and redressed in the dressing room. Trays were prepared in the diet kitchen for all bed patients. Medicines were prepared and chart work done in the nurse's room. The lounging rooms were used by ambulatory cases for reading, writing, and smoking, and playing of games served to keep patients out of the corridors. The immense kitchen in the basement of the Grand Hotel was put at the disposal of Hospital B, and a butcher shop for the unit was also commodiously located there. Base hospitals had a special room near the entrance, which was fitted up as a receiving room. There, tub and shower baths were installed for ambulatory patients who were able to use them. Orderlies assisted undressing those cases in bathing and redressing them in pajamas, slippers, and bathrobes. Stretchers were placed out long and low on narrow tables. Undressing by orderlies and bathed by nurses after being redressed carried through the hall to the x-ray laboratory. The x-ray department was unusually well equipped. It had at its disposal a standard x-ray table for plate work with all the necessary appliances in one room, a fluoroscopic table with appliances for vertical examination, and another room, a dark room for developing plates, and an office provided with a large showcase and stereoscopic outfit for examination of the plates. Surgery wasn't the only kind of cutting done at Hospital B. Here a barber shows his work. Hospital B was a surgical hospital and the staff performed many operations. Here is an example of two of them. One removing a blood clot from a soldier's head. The second is a fluoroscopic removal of shrapnel from a soldier's head. Hospital C was also known as a palace and was one of the five large buildings used to house the patients of base hospital number 36. It was well located on a hill with beautiful and wholesome outlook in every direction. Up until the time of it being taken over by the Americans, it was used as a French military hospital, and some of the rooms were reserved for the French military afterwards. An inspection of the building before it was taken over by the Americans showed it to have possibilities as a hospital, but its present condition was not satisfactory for a hospital. Hospital C was a rundown summer hotel, which was made into a workable army hospital. It was supplied by many things Uncle Sam could not furnish or could only furnish after a long delay. Those involved a lot of times dipped into their own pocket to supply articles needed for the hospital. Hospital D, or the Macomb County Hospital as it was known, also it was known as the DeSources Hotel, was taken over from the French on December 20, 1917. The building before the war was a large summer hotel used for the accommodation of visitors who came to Vittel for the baths and the waters, for which the town is famous. The building has been used since the beginning of the war by the French military as a hospital. The staff of Hospital G was led by Lieutenant Colonel Henry C. Berry, 
Mount Clemens, Michigan, Captain Arthur J. Warren, Mount Clemens, Captain George P. Sackrider, Owasso, and Lieutenant A. Arthur MacArthur, Lapeer, Michigan. One late arrival to the hospital was Captain George P. Rinaldi, Assistant Surgeon from Birmingham, Michigan. He arrived on March 17, 1918. In charge of the X-ray laboratory was Major A. B. Smith. Hospital E was designated for strictly medical cases and did not formally open until April 7, 1918. The Hotel de Parc had been chosen to become the last scene of hospital activity, partly because the number of patients had not exceeded the capacity of the other buildings and partly because the hotel was not equipped with suitable heating facilities for cold weather. During the process of preparation of this hospital, it was seen fit to have a party. The building looked new and clean and the dining room floor was the best ever seen of a tell. There was a grand march and award of prizes for the best dancers, excellent music, games of cards, and suitable refreshments. No doubt it was the best party the 36th ever had. Hospital E was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel T.A. McGaw, Jr. The staff physicians were Captain George Van Ree, Captain Claude B. Gaines, and Captain Ward E. Collins. The research department of the hospital consisted of the x-ray laboratory and the clinical laboratory. The research department was headed by Major Myron W. Cliff. The x-ray laboratory was commanded by Captain Royston E. Scafford. The clinical laboratory was headed up by Captain Joseph Sill. Assistants were Lieutenant Anthony J. Font and Lieutenant Scott S. Fay, not pictured. Thank you.